It's time to hit the road and discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. Get ready to travel deep into the heart of the Lone Star State, meeting friendly folks and exploring fascinating places. Experience a way of life like nowhere else in the world. As we uncover the rich history and culture of Texas, discover adventure, discover excitement, discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. Today we will see the beauty of blown glass that is found in San Marcos. We will visit with Tim DeYoung, owner and head gaffer of Wimberley Glassworks. In this episode, we will see glass blowing demonstrations that show the process of crafting molten glass into exceptional art, such as vases, platters, sculptures, and more. Every piece that is created by Tim and his team is unique with brilliant colors and amazing shapes. Last but not least, I will participate in a class that allows me to experience the thrill of coloring, shaping, and creating a beautiful glass flower. My name is Tim DeYoung, and you're here at Wimberley Glassworks. We make everything from $5 refrigerator magnets to half million dollar chandeliers. I learned to blow glass in art school, every parent's nightmare. It began probably way before I went to art school. After high school, I told my father I didn't want to go to college. Being that he was the first one in his family to go to college, he wasn't really happy with that. So he um, gave me a tough love lesson. He gave me $300 and a one-way ticket to Seattle. We lived in New Jersey. He told me to work my way home. If I didn't want to go to college after that, we would talk. It took four and a half months to get home. I lived under the Congress Avenue Bridge for six weeks, and I still pick up change walking across the AGP parking lot. I just cannot let it sit there. <laughs> I was so poor, and I worked the worst jobs. So when I got home, he was like, so, do you want to go to college? I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. Where did I go? I said I wanted to go to art school. He started to get upset and went, excuse me, I kept up my end of the bargain, you have to keep up yours. So I went to art school. To this day, I am the only one in the family that does what I went to school for. <laughs> so that trip and that experience turned me into a risk taker because I had nothing to lose. I had already been at rock bottom you know, so it didn't scare me to be at rock bottom because I, I knew how to get out, you know. So when I started the company, I did $2,000 gross my first year. A lot of people would have closed the doors, walked away and, you know, never looked back. For me, it was like, oh, so this isn't working. So what else can I do? So I closed the shop during the week, went up to Austin and fixed houses and blue glass on the weekends. I did that for two years. On the third year, a friend of mine came in and helped me for free for a year and the shop took off. And it's never gone backward. By being at rock bottom, you develop the, the desire to learn from everything and everyone. And that's really shaped the glass studio. The reason why we have work in here that can hold its own with anything in the world is we design as a group. When I hire people, I always hire people that are better than me in different areas. I would say that one of my greatest strengths as a business person is that I know where I'm weak. I recognize where I'm weak. I hire people that are better than me in those areas. That way the whole studio grows. Glass blowing wise, I always try to hire people that have more skills than me in different areas. That way they can come here, I learn from them, they learn from me, the whole studio grows. So I started the glass company in Wimberley uh, 25 years ago. I started in 1992. I, when I outgrew the facility, this was the only property that was available uh, on Ranch Road 12. So I bought it. It was remarkably affordable. I couldn't believe how affordable it was. And we soon after built this building, and uh, here we are. We have a gallery where we make, uh, we make you know, functional glasswork, uh, and we make a tremendous amount of lighting. Lighting is really what we're, we're known for. 
Uh, and then we also have another half of the company where we do high-end uh, corporate uh, office building installations. And they're all over the country. Here at Wimberley Glassworks, we're open to the public right now. We uh, offer classes, we offer end-to-end uh, -end demonstrations, one after the other, every day but Monday. Uh, Monday we melt, and uh, you know, you're welcome to come on in and check it out. Now, my favorite pieces to make are the, are the corporate installations, because I always have to think outside the box. I always have to, we, we can't repeat anything. You know, our, our clients are like, you know, you know if we're, we're going to have hand bone glass, we want it to be unique. We don't want the same thing that everything else, everyone else has. You know, I have one client that says, I don't want a Chihuly. If I wanted a Chihuly, I would buy a Chihuly. I want something different. You know, so every time we work for them, it's like, okay, we have this building. This is the theme. What are you going to come up with that's new? It's a challenge. Trust me. <laughs> Don't go away, we will soon add more color to your day. Hold on to your hat, we'll be right back. To start out with, I'm going to make sure the pipes are hot. They need to be cherry red. Cherry red is right around 1500 degrees. So this is the color of clear glass at 2,110 degrees. At this temperature, glass moves like honey. If I stop turning the pipe, it's going to drip off the end like honey would off a spoon. So the first thing I'm going to do is cool and shape the glass using the marver table. The marver table is the fastest way to cool and shape the glass. You can think of the steel on the steel table as stealing heat out of the glass. Okay, so it's still solid at this point, so I need to put a bubble in here. The heat at the end of the pipe expands the air. It can't go out where my thumb is, so it's going to move into the glass and blow its own bubble. Here it comes. When you want it to stop, you just take your thumb off the mouthpiece. Okay, so now I'm just going to let it cool down for a little bit, and then we're going to get our next layer of glass over the top. So each glass piece is built up in a series of layers. The number of layers determines the size of the piece. Now in this layer, I'm going to roll it over a pile of crushed up colored glass. This is a cranberry color. So just because these little bits of glass stick easily to the hot glass, it doesn't change the fact that I need to heat them up so that they'll expand and move around at the same rate as the clear. Also, each one of these little bits of color is going to melt into a puddle. If I want the entire layer to look like it's this color, I'm going to need about three or four layers of puddles to overlap to get that to happen. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is start to smooth this color into the surface. The first thing you'll notice is how quickly it changes color when we roll it across the table here. What you're actually seeing is a temperature change. Now there's no check valve in the pipe. There's nothing to prevent the air from getting pushed out of the bubble. Okay, so what we do is before we move on to our next step, we reestablish that bubble by using that capping off trick. So we use white on that piece here as a divider color. We add cranberry on the inside, we're going to put that real intense green on the outside. So if we don't put the white in there, it looks like mud. It's like taking a cranberry transparency and a green transparency and putting it over the top of each other. It just looks muddy. So to get the colors to pop and look really pretty, we put white between the two. So 
This tool that I'm about to use here has an 1850 year old history. It's called a wood block. Wood blocks were invented by the Romans. They're made from apple, pear, or cherry wood only. The reason for this is when you burn this wood, it develops hairline cracks. When you soak it in water, the cracks hold a tremendous amount of water in them. When the glass rides through the form, it boils the water, creates steam, and the steam shapes the glass. So what you saw coming off the tool was not smoke, it's steam. This is called a strip gather. I just want a thin film of glass over the top. I don't really want a whole lot of glass on here because it's a four gather piece and I really don't want a five gather piece and I don't want the thing to become too huge. Now the one thing you're going to notice, you're going to see this really pretty green on the table here, but after I heat it up, it's going to look like a, you know, olive in a martini. It's going to have that weird little olive color. The entire time I work with it, it's going to look like that. Okay. Um, all colors undergo what's called the red shift. They shift towards red because they're hot. So these, this nice bright green will end up looking like an olive. Whites look creamy. Yellows look orange. Oranges look red. Reds look brown. We got this really cool color once, Ferrari red. I swear to you, it looks just like a Ferrari when it's cool. But we made this nice piece when we first got it. And it was like, we put it in the annealing oven and it was like, God, I can't believe we spent 180 bucks on this color. And it looks like something went wrong in the septic tank. <laughs> so, next day it looked like a red Ferrari. Okay, so I'm all done getting the color on, uh, the frit color. Amanda here has picked up a, a you pick up blue, picked up a, a chunk of a color called silver blue. It's a uh, cobalt blue with a lot of silver nitrate in it. And uh, we're going to apply it to this bubble in a vertical fashion. These are our bamboo stalks. So now I'm getting ready for uh, our bamboo stalks. I'm just going to do a little shaping using this tool. This is just six sheets of wet newspaper. Next color is called citron yellow, and it's going to uh, go on. It goes on super thin, but it goes on horizontally. And then we'll melt melt it all in together. What happens is the citron yellow will melt up and over the top of the silver blue. When we flatten it out afterward, it um, retains a three-dimensional look because it had to melt up and over the top of the the raised glass. Yeah, that'll be fine. Much better keep this time, by the way, I think. Okay, so now I'm going to work that all into the surface. So now I've kind of had that flattened out, I'm going to use the wood block again, only this time it's a little bit less for shaping and more to enhance the metal-to-metal -metal chemical reaction that occurs in this piece. As the wood block starts to burn a little bit, it creates what's called a reduction environment. I'll do it with the paper. So when I create this reduction environment, I actually am pulling the silver in the silver blue to the surface. 
that will intensify the reaction with the citron yellow. You have to have a little bit of water in there, otherwise you burn a hole through the side of the stainless steel pot. A cubic foot of glass is 177 pounds. So, for every gather, then the weight does increase, but the real problem comes that you have a really bad spot on the fulcrum with glass blowing. For every eight to 10 inches away from your front hand, the end of the glass piece is, the weight feels like it's double. So it's only probably seven pounds of glass, but it feels like 20. So in an effort to hold it closer, I'm gonna have to cool the pipe down. So the closer up to the end of the pipe you can hold it, the easier it is to move it around the studio. Now you can tell by the gradation of color that all the heat is down here at the tip of the bubble. If I were to just start inflating the glass piece with this heat situation, I'd blow the bubble straight out the bottom. So the first thing we're doing is we're pushing it into a cone shape. It's very difficult to push a round bubble into a cone shape. So this will help to force the glass to inflate near the pipe while preserving some of the glass to use later at the bottom. Now I take that pad of wet newspaper, blow, squeeze the tip of the bubble and push towards the blowpipe. Thus forcing the glass to inflate right off the end of the pipe. Stop. Right there. Okay, so now we're going to be putting in what's called the neckline or the jack mark. This line defines where the lip of the piece is going to be as well as where the piece is going to break off the blowpipe. If the line is not well defined, you can break the glass piece trying to get it off the pipe later on. Back. This is like someone putting on the disc brakes. It's actually really hard to turn the pipe. Back. I have to tell her when I'm changing directions, because if I don't, and I change directions, she'll just pinch it right off. It's really really hard to make a nice piece when you have a flat spot. Thank you. Hello? So these are solid cork paddles. It's one of the only ways you can flatten a glass piece and not leave any marks. Now I'm just heating up the very tip because it's the only place I want to move right now. We're now going to reorient the piece to another rod so we can open it up. The sign of most hand-blown glass is that there's a mark in the middle of the bottom. That mark is called the punty mark, P-U-N-T-Y. And the next step will show you how that mark gets there. It helps if you make a little noise when you stick it on there. A few drops of water along this line are going to start hairline cracks. Those cracks will travel through the jack mark with a little tap, breaking the piece free from the blowpipe.
So right now I've got one last chance to center the glass piece on the new rod, and that's right now. While the bottom connection is still super hot, thank you. I can roll the piece down the bench. I'm looking for a high spot, which is really hard to see when I'm flat the piece. I can lift up on the nodes and it would sag back on center. So this is traditionally the longest reheat. We're taking what was the coolest part of the piece, the area closest to the blowpipe, and we're now making it the hottest part. Now I'm making sure that when I spin this, I'm spinning it on axis. And as hard as I can. It's really good for the rotator cuff. <laughs> I have to allow the top to cool while I keep the bottom hot. So the last place the piece goes is into this oven here. The oven is called the annealing oven. Annealing is a big word for slow cooling. If you don't slowly cool the glass pieces down when you're done with them, they're going to break. So everything we make today goes in there. You can't touch it again until tomorrow morning. Hold on to your hat. We'll be right back. After Tim's demonstration, I got a crash course on glass blowing and sculpting. Amanda was great. She helped me create a beautiful glass flower. This course was well structured and lots of fun. It has been an amazing day. If you're ever in the area, come by by Wimberley Glassworks, visit their gallery, and let Tim and his team give you an amazing demonstration on how glass is blown and transformed into a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. This is Annie Studebaker. Let's discover Texas together.